Alice Vale. And I'm Monsignor Charles Minor. Religious cults have been very much in the news lately. Tonight on Real to Real, we'll meet a man who knows more than the average person when it comes to cults. And he has founded an ecumenical organization to help people deal with them. We'll also travel to Cummings, Georgia to visit The Place, a center that provides everything from emergency funds to health facilities for the poor of the area. Our short segments feature the Song of St. Francis, performed by John Michael Talbot, and People in Places introduces us to the guest minister at a Georgia monastery, Father Francis. Jim McCarthy was not satisfied with any information he was getting on religious cults from newspapers and magazines. He wanted to know more. And so he developed a program of his master's thesis and his doctoral dissertation on religious cults and then took that information to the Catholic Church. It's interesting that more Catholics seem to be attracted to religious cults than from any other denomination. And so began Sanctuary. Yeah, that's what's happening, brother. Jesus Christ is back on earth. So that's our witness. Now, so wherever we go, because we walk with the Lord, well, uh, there's always something happening. So These are members of the Christ the family. You think you're here like all the hundreds God. of cults in Colorado, they are looking God for converts. And it's the perfect right. place. So the cities provide thousands of college students looking for answers, and the mountains provide isolation for religious retreats. Yes, it's a good breeding ground for cults here. As a matter of fact, in the Denver metropolitan area alone, there are more cults per square mile than in any area of the country except for San Francisco. Many listen and follow. A few listen and fight. Well, you see, you're getting, you're getting caught up in, in games, man. When Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ ain't a name. Jesus Christ is the living word of God. Jesus Christ is the power of God, love itself. All right. right That's your saying. witness, man. Your life is your witness. Right now your, your, your fruits are rotten, man. Your fruits are rotten. Your fruits are dead flesh, man. Your fruits are eating dead flesh. How do you think the whole evolution, the butterflies, the flies are there for the frogs. Not the frogs are there. Dead. The frogs are You're there. You're dead. You're all dead, man. You live for Safeway and Villa Italia so you can have it. You're a Babylonian. No killing. No killing. Tell the Russians I can't make it. I got a previous engagement for peace on earth. Armageddon, laying it low, low, low to the ground, laying it low, low, low to the ground in an instant. You don't want to be stuck in the mud in an instant. You don't want to be stuck in the mud. You need Who are these people? Are they crazy? Are they dangerous? Who are they following and why? And are they finding whatever varieties of inner peace they've been promised? You'll only find it at the Lord's feet. See you later. These are just some of the questions Jim McCarthy is trying to answer. He has founded Sanctuary, also known as the Network on Religious Movements. Basically, it's a better business bureau of religious cults. His information service gets about 150 calls a day from police, social service agencies, but mostly from desperate parents trying to find their children. It's like cancer or car accidents. It always happens to someone else. It just blows the family apart. It's, it has the effect. It, so in fact, uh, I think that alcoholism or drug abuse or a major problem in the family would have. Thank you. The people who are susceptible to cult influences are generally caring people Hi. who have been frustrated by the lack of feeling in society and in their churches. Jim has studied these followers for years while working on his theological dissertation. 
Now he exchanges his information with that of law enforcement officers like Detective David Hayes. Jim, were you able to come up with any of the information I uh, asked you about or the group I asked you about? Okay, yes. As a matter of fact, um, I received from the Cody Police Department some information on Christ family, okay. which is the group that's now you know, making its way through Colorado. The success of Sanctuary depends on social service agencies, churches, the FBI, and the police, all pooling their information with Jim. This is just for the purposes of finding him. <clears throat> There's not going to be any action taken. They're not, they're not finding him to kidnap him. Okay. They're finding him to uh, just to know if he's dead or alive. Sanctuary is not a kidnapping or deprogramming institution. The constitutional right to religious freedom of choice is always respected. And here in Boulder's Mall, there's an incredible variety of choice. The mall seems to be the supermarket of religious cults. One says Jesus Christ is the way, but to defend that way with rifles. Another says beards and beads are the sign of the devil. Cults differ from each other in their vast number of intricate ideologies, but cults differ from organized religion in two basic ways. First, cults do not honestly represent themselves, and second, they require that followers not question their teachings. The Christ family, whom we saw earlier, is a good example. They preach vegetarianism and peace, and that Jesus Christ has returned in the form of Brother Lightning. Locals just call these people the garbage eaters. You got to learn to be free and to walk in righteousness no matter what, and then see that God is going to take care of you. You know, like just today, we went behind a grocery store, right? And there's a whole case of apple juice thrown out, mm -hmm. except one bottle was busted. Mm -hmm. So we take it, man, and then we give away a bottle of it and, and turn people out and drink it. You know, it's God's taking care of his children, brother. Since the idea is for them to get converts, they'll sit and talk to just about anyone. How come y'all smoke beautiful? We enjoy it. It's what Jesus smokes. Jim's goal is to get information, and that isn't easy. What did you do before you joined this group? Same thing you're doing, brother. Worked, went to school. <laughs> Where did you go to school? That wouldn't matter, brother. When you're totally walking away, love, this is where you live. This is life of the perfection of the saints. We live on earth as in heaven, right? No killing, no sex, no materialism. Is that a sleeping bag? Yeah, this is, brother. Sleeping bag. Where do you think you'll sleep tonight? That I don't know. Wherever God wants us to. Yeah. That's one of the reasons it's so hard to track down these kids. Do your parents don't know where you are? Or no, brother. They don't, don't even know if you're dead or alive? Well, that would be what would bring me down, I'll tell you that, because I've done it. I mean, my own witness is that I've gone back, right, and I've checked it out, and all they wanted me to do, brother, was come and live back with them. It's up to God, you know, whether they know I'm dead or alive. Many find that promised peace, at least for a while, but eventually most people see the sham, and their illusions are shattered. That was the case for Lynn, Ed, and Steve. For seven years, they thought the Maharishi held all the answers. I realized that I needed something. I needed peace in my life. I, there was a, the way I looked at it, there was a hole, like Albert Schweitzer said, or something, there was a hole in your heart, you know, a God-shaped vacuum or something that needed to be filled. And the cult said it could fill it. I couldn't do anything without you know, giving him the credit for it. If I felt happy, he was he was the source of my happiness. If I was, if I, but if I was sad, that was my own problem. Eventually, they realized their guru was not perfect, and they left. But leaving is harder than one may think. I mean, I thought really that I had a brain tumor or something this year because simple things would not register. What would you tell someone, an individual or group? who are getting involved in cults now? I would probably say that uh, what you think is going to be answered isn't going to be answered. Would you all be willing to talk to parents of kids that are still in it? Definitely. 
I guess I feel a certain sense of responsibility. I wouldn't want anyone to spend seven years like I did of an involvement in something that's not real, not true. Dreams die hard, and breaking away is a difficult, painful process. If it happens, I, you know, it's, it's usually a joyous time for the people, for the families. If it doesn't happen, then there's always tomorrow. You know, I never give up. Breaking away from a cult isn't easy. It's a hard road to travel. But fortunately, Jim is going to be around for a while to help anyone who wants to make the journey. What began as one man's quest for knowledge and information on the subject in which he was vitally interested has developed into a national organization. And I'm sure that many families whose lives have been affected by pseudo-religious cults are grateful for Jim McCarthy. so much to be consoled as to console to be understood as to understand and not so much to be loved as to love another When the Second Vatican Council asked for a greater openness to the world, the Monastery of the Holy Spirit in Conyers, Georgia, began inviting the public to come and see what their life was like. The thousands upon thousands of visitors that have come since have all met Father Francis, the guest master. Uh, come on, come in there now. Hey, come in. Father. I saw you before. Hello, you Father. were here before. It's good to be uh, back Come again. over here now. Here's some papers that signed. 
Father Francis has been a Trappist monk for 50 years, and in his time as a guest master, he has taken over 86,000 boys and girls around the monastery. After the tour of the monastery, Father Francis gives every boy and girl his address with a promise to write. I suppose I got over 15,000 letters from boys and girls. That's hardly a day I, I don't get two or three letters. One Christmas when stamps only cost uh, six cents, I got 420 uh, uh, letters. Father Francis keeps all the pictures that the children send him, or at least all the ones his room can hold. The pictures, well, they began to send them to me, and I thought well, I would uh, keep them. So it helps me to remember them and to pray for them. That's the real purpose of the whole thing. And then some of these girls, especially girls, when they get into college, that's when they get lonesome. They want me to write letters to them, little love letters, no love letters, or anything like that. So many of these things here on the wall were given to me by boys and girls. Uh, Girls like to give you things uh, more than boys, and they like to have their pictures taken more than boys, too. If they send me a picture of themselves, I have to thank them for it. And then I tell them I put it in my book, and. I'll always see it and I pray for them that way. Better than a pen pal, Father Francis is a prayer pal, and through his hospitality of prayer, he extends the visit of all the children that come to the monastery. In 1975, four Adrian Dominican nuns left the frenzy of the big city for Cummins, Georgia, a rural area just outside of Atlanta. Here they established the place, a center that helps the poor of that area. Well, the place has 10 full-time and 50 part-time volunteers who help with the work, and three of the original sisters still remain. They've set up their convent on a goat farm not far from the place, and this is where our story begins. Coming Georgia is a rural area north of Atlanta. Nearby is a goat dairy farm, the home of three Dominican sisters, Catherine Clyatt. You're so nervous, aren't you? Come on. June Rancico and Nancy Ann Turner. Okay, you're going to come in about noon? Um, I'll try to get there by noon. Okay, we'll see you later then. Okay, bye-bye. Have a good day. Bye, you too. ugly goat. Okay, we lived in the church in the beginning. It was a, a house that had just been recently purchased for the use of a few Catholics who had gathered together to have liturgies, and a priest was assigned. Um, he lived in Gwinnett County and then came up for liturgies on Sundays here. We lived in that house for two years and um, developed our ministry out of the house. As they were developing a ministry to deal with the rural poverty that surrounded them, the church in which they lived grew and needed to expand. The sisters had started a clothing program at the church, and as their program grew, they also needed more room. It took them approximately four months to find the farm. 
Remembering that we all were big city girls from Detroit, Chicago, and Miami, we had to learn everything from scratch. Uh, we were anxious to learn and we listened. We just really listened a lot. And as we listened, we began to appreciate the underlying currents of what the culture here was all about. We began to appreciate that more and more and felt that we wanted to enter into that as much as we could uh, for our own growth, as well as to try to support what seems to be a dying culture, the Appalachian culture and the farm culture. Several years ago, the government dammed the Chattahoochee River and flooded 54,000 acres of farmland to supply water to Atlanta. The new lake began to be settled by commuters and the coming community began to change. The sisters' ministry began to grow, trying to bring hope, pride, and help to those in a crisis situation. Their clothing thrift shop grew to accommodate all the needs of the people and was called The Place, a place for people who are in need of help. The community uh, that we help here are the low-income families in the county, mostly people who have been born and raised in this county, um, whose families have always struggled. They um, are undereducated, um, mostly lacking in skills, a lot of very basic practical knowledge, but uh, lacking in skills that, that will make them employable. The place offers many services, from financial help to emotional help to training for skills that might help in the future. Everyone that comes to the place works off its bills. There are no handouts. But rather than just have people do busy work, we, in the initial interview, we ask them what you know, their basic talents or skills are. Many will say they have none, but we say, can you use a chainsaw? And a man will say, well, yeah, I can use a chainsaw. And they say, we have this old couple down the road who needs some firewood. You know, If you can cut up some firewood for them, we'll credit you. Uh, on your bill and you've also helped out another family. But there are some that need more than financial help. They need some kind of counseling or therapy. This is where art therapist sister Nancy Ann Turner's expertise lies. Mary, we were talking earlier if in this session about one of the things that you really hope for is that someday you'll feel free. Can you tell me a little bit more what that means to you? Yeah, it'd be just me and the children and I believe we'll have a happier home. Mm -hmm. We try to help people, through the expression of art, understand themselves better, express a feeling better, communicate an ache better. A lot of the people with whom I'm working are not very verbal or they're very afraid of words. And so a lot of times it's much easier for them to make a scared picture or paint an angry feeling than to talk about it. And then once they've got it out, they're able to look at it much better understand it. We talk about it after they make the feeling, make the picture. I think one of the most exciting things that's happened the last year or so, that people who used to just care about survival now care about quality to their life. Mm -hmm. And I think that we try really hard to uh, provide some creativity to being low income, to provide some good options for being low income. Well, they helped me a lot when I lost my kids and everything, and they helped me get my life straight back out. This is the only place I know that would help us. Nowhere else won't, so. I believe the mission of the place is to probably create a better atmosphere for the people who are so down in the dumps to make them feel that they're really worth something and they can do something, even if it's just a small item. Then they can, they can grow and become more of a person. Here's the other two pillows. Oh, I'm glad to see those. <laughs> We've had a lot of requests for the size, and I'm really glad you're working on them. How'd they turn out? I, I like this way, but I tried it the way Helen said to do mm -hmm. it, and the fabric's so thick that it just pokes out too much. Okay. Here's your first check. Okay, ten dollars richer. <laughs> yeah. Let's go put him in the store, right? All right. Arts and crafts, weavings, paintings are all bought or their value subtracted from their working bill and sold at the store. The profit is funneled back into the emergency fund to help the next family that comes. The farm is my survival. It's home. <laughs> I, find, I find it very difficult. I, I know I could not spend five days a week here because uh, 
the work I do is listening to um, hard story after hard story over and over again, and the work can get very depressing. So it's good for me to have that day on the farm, uh, on the day that I'm not here, to, um, to have time alone, some time for prayer and reflection, uh, some time to get some of my anger and hostility out, because you can become very angry with uh, the people in the systems that keep people poor. Mama, just feed the boys. The work at the place is not always easy. Um, we see the pain of people all day. We see the joy with them too, and we celebrate together. But I think we celebrate only after we've suffered the pain together. Uh, we see people who are at the end of their rope. Um, they're desperate and they're frightened. We, um, we have to maintain an attitude of hope ourselves. I feel that that's the gift we bring. We have a little money, but not much. And we have a little food, and we have a little clothing, and, and that can help a little. But what we really have to maintain is, is an attitude of hope, a spirit of hope. I'm thrilled when people have learned to be proud of themselves, when they've learned to express themselves, to feel more alive, and not just feel useless, or unwanted, or down and depressed. And, and that they've learned to also see further than themselves. I think that's a big thing. The place is a big thing for these people. Not only does it provide them with an avenue for economic support, but it also gives the people a feeling of self-worth and participation. And with the help of the sisters, there's no doubt that they'll make it. Next week, we'll examine the work of local artist Bob McGovern, who uses his talent to capture the images of Christ in wood and on canvas. And we'll meet a man who battles against heavy odds to give direction to fatherless boys in New York City. Alice has finally come. Everyone can say, thank God, summer is here. Oh, and I'm saying it out loud, too, because that feels great to feel the warmth of the sunshine after this long winter. And I think everybody's going to end up escaping to the beach and to the mountains. Wherever you go, though, I hope it's not an escape from the realities you truly believe in. Summertime and rest and recreation give you also an opportunity for quiet prayer and redeveloping again those fundamentals of church visits, prayer, and family gatherings. So enjoy yourself this summer. Let's go get a tan. We'll see you at the beach. I'm all for that. Goodbye and God bless you. <laughs>